So um, basically, when we think about fruits, um, most often, these are the fruits that come to mind. Um, what we consider the, the staples for the backyard here in East Tennessee and, and pretty much um, throughout the South. But there's a lot of different things that we can grow. And actually, some of these that are listed here, like peaches, um, cherries, nectarines, um, those can be quite finicky to grow. And there's actually others that can perform a little bit better here. Okay, so some of the ones we're going to talk about tonight, well actually we're going to talk about all these that you see listed here. So let me just preface by saying I'm not going to go into detail on each one of these, but the first five or six I'm going to be a little bit more detailed in because that seems to be where a lot of the interest lies and we've really seen um, an interest and, and pick up on these in, in production in the last decade. So um, some of those last 20 or so, probably just a slide or two, so don't get nervous when I start going through the pawpaws and think, oh my lord, we're going to be here till midnight tonight. Um, just as an FYI, I put this slide in here to remind me, um, there are so many resources in the Google Drive tonight. I think I actually called it, you go to the February 8th um, Google folder and then go to fruit files and there's about 20 different resources in there for you to look as well as some different recipes for some of these um, native fruits and everything. So to get us started, uh, Paw Paws, this is one that has really um, just taken off in the, in the last decade. Uh, folks have developed a really keen interest in the Paw Paw. Uh, another one that, or another thing that makes it so special is that you'll notice there that it's excellent for, for organic production. There's very little um, uh, disease issues with these, which is one reason a lot of folks like them. Uh, you can see from that map there where uh, the tree is native to the Eastern US, um, one of the things that sets it apart from some of our other backyard fruits is that really distinct and um, aroma as well as the flavor. It's highly aromatic. Um, many people will call this the Appalachian banana because it's got that sweet tropical like flavor. Um, I don't personally like bananas so I don't think pawpaws really taste like bananas. I think it's got some medley of maybe melon and papaya and some other tropical um, like fruits but it's, it's re just really distinctive with its own flavor. Um, it is a large oblong fruit and it's going to grow in those um, clusters usually or it'll grow just singular on the tree. And this is what the inside of that fruit looks like which is another reason many folks like it. Um, just as an FYI when we start talking about uh, the different ways that you can produce these tree, a, a grafted tree is going to give you uh, fruit in about three to four years which is another reason folks like growing the papayas. Uh, but you can kind of tell from this picture the fruit's going to be ripe when it kind of is soft and it gives a little bit. It's got that almost custardy like in interior. Um, the color is not always going to be indicative of ripeness because it can vary from a, you can kind of see this here, a greenish color to a light yellow color. Um, so it's always going to be kind of hard to tell. It's just basically squeezing that fruit that's going to tell you uh, when it's ripe. It's going to kind of have the texture of a banana when you when you um, squeeze it. Um, you can save the pawpaws after you pick them for about three to five days, but if you store those in the refrigerator, and just remember not to do that with any kind of fruit like apples that give off ethylene gas, but you can store those um, for about uh, one to three weeks in the refrigerator, or if you choose to freeze it for up to a year. Uh, just caution you on uh, freezing it because you can probably tell by the, the fruit that um, it's kind of pulpy and again custardy. Freezing it, you kind of lose some of the texture. So if you really like the texture, you might want to just eat fresh or use it fresh. A wild collected fruit, uh, which again it is native, so you're going to see that here. It can be a little bit smaller in size than what you're going to graft or even grow from seed. Uh, the, the wild collected are going to have many more seeds than the picture I just showed you there, and they're also going to leave that little bitter aftertaste in your mouth, so it's going to be a matter of preference. Uh, notice here that fruit from grafted trees of name varieties is going to be a higher quality and you're not going to have that aftertaste, which is what a lot of folks that are starting to plant pawpaws kind of prefer in that regard. And I just put a picture in here of that pawpaw pudding because again it's going to have the texture and the consistency like a pumpkin pie, so that's one um, dessert that a lot of people will utilize it for. 
You can see the foliage there or what it looks like just uh, getting started. Uh, many different cultivars are going to be available. There is a link to Kentucky State University's website that's going to have much more information uh, included there than what I have here tonight. So make sure that you click that link um, in the PowerPoint and go visit that site because there's a lot of um, information there. Also notice there that uh, most paw, uh, pawpaw cultivars are believed to be self incompatible. So you're going to have to have two genetically different trees. So cross pollination um, can occur. Now, again, saying that they're growing in the wild, uh, many folks will want to wild harvest those, dig those up and bring them home. Um, it's, it's not a good ethical practice to really get into, especially out of national forest or national parks and that kind of thing. But the other thing to that is that they just don't transplant well. And you can see here by looking at um, the root system of those trees, that's going to be the biggest reason why. It's going to be really hard to, to move that tree without disturbing the roots. Um, it's an easy tree to grow, but it just doesn't like to be moved. So that's another thing to kind of consider um, as you get some growth on your trees they're not going to take well to transplant. So if you're one of those that like to kind of move things around, um, be really conscientious of that up front and, and put these trees kind of where you want them to, to start with. And notice there, container trees will uh, tra transplant best just because that root, those roots are confined. Um, pawpaws, you want to plant those in a deep, fertile, and well-drained, slightly acidic soil. Uh, you don't want any um, heavy or waterlogged soil. So if you have a really heavy clay soil, you're going to want to mend that with some organic matter first and make sure you've got good drainage. So many of you are growing blueberries, so that's going to be very similar uh, to growing pawpaws, although you don't need to be quite that acidic as you would be for blueberries. Um, even though they don't like to be waterlogged, you got to keep them regularly watered, especially the first year that you plant them, and then making sure that um, supplemental fertilization is going to be added in late winter, early spring each year. And then of course, um, pawpaws are going to be one of those understory trees that we see in our native forest. So they're going to be shaded um, more than, you know, like our, our maples and some of the nut trees and things like that. But at home, if we're planting these in the backyard, make sure you get them in full sun because as they mature, that's going to be best for the fruit production. So even though in its natural habitat, it's going to do well in the shade and it will do well in the shade in your backyard. But if you're wanting to reap the benefits of the fruit, then make sure that you get it in full sun. And you can kind of see there that for the first couple of years, put the, the shade cloth or a tree guard, uh, tree shelter on those um, just to kind of get them started. Then hand pollination um, is also going to be helpful. Um, you know, you don't, they're, let's see, what is it? The flies and beetles are said to pollinate the pawpaws, but they're not always going to be very dependable. So that's one thing to be uh, conscious of as well. Now, if you um, have ever seen the bloom, you probably recognize it's, uh, a lot of people will say it's an odorous bloom. It's got a stink to the, to the flower, um, but it's kind of a cool looking little flower too. So it makes a really pretty addition to the, the edible landscape. You can actually direct seed your pawpaw seeds. Uh, you, you just be aware that it is going to be a slow process as with anything growing from seed. Uh, but research has shown us that that's going to contribute to a healthier tree over time. Uh, the big thing is to just make sure that you don't let those seeds freeze or dry out as with any seed. And then um, plant your seeds during a cold period. They're going to need that stratification. So planting them in the fall um, is going to give them that opportunity to chill over the winter and then just protect the area you plant so they don't get trampled on. Um, we're probably all bad to do that. Sow things in the in the wintertime and be like, oh yeah, I forgot I did that. Or you notice they're purchasing bare root plants or seedlings and you would plant those in the spring. And kind of see what um, the foliage or what the tree is going to look like there. Um, if you are purchasing a grafted tree, the price range can be upwards of about $15. Um, partial crops can be obtained about three to four years after uh, planting a grafted tree. That's another reason folks do like the to purchase the grafted, uh, but they will bear a full crop after about five years. 
And pawpaw trees are notorious for suckering out and, and becoming bushy. So uh, many people will do that just to kind of form a hedgerow or a fence line and that's fine. But you can also um, prune those to be more upright. So um, pruning is not gonna hurt them at all. It's actually gonna encourage more fruit production. And just so you know, the fruit is gonna form on new wood every year. So if you are pruning, you know, make sure that you're not pruning away the, the new wood. And usually if people are kind of letting them form a fence row, you'll still prune some of those wayward or crossing branches um, just to help again, encourage vigor with the fruit. I did include a link in here for you to be able to uh, watch a video on how to prune um, different, different modalities. Okay, so moving on to persimmons. This is another one that is uh, growing in popularity. It's really popular because uh, one persimmon is going to contain about 55% of your recommended intake of vitamin A every day. And this is going to be another one of our native species. But here's a word of caution. Uh, we do have a native and oriental species. So if you want to, to grow a native landscape, then make sure you purchase the Virginiana species because the Oriental, um, many people, and that's spelled wrong, I just saw that, but uh, the Oriental, a lot of folks will actually mix these because they both have their pros and cons. Uh, one of the things you'll notice there is that our native is gonna be hardy down to negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes them very well adept in this area. So you can grow them pretty much anywhere. Um, these are the natives that we're gonna see actually growing in those roadsides or in our native forest. Uh, the Oriental has not even been around about a hundred years. Notice there that it will die back about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's also gonna be a little bit finickier about soils. But here's the big clincher. You know, we always have to give and take something, right? So um, the Oriental has said to be superior in quality to the native fruit. And you can see that depicted here. Um, a little bit of a shinier, more orange sheen. Oftentimes these will be a little bit wrinkled, almost prune-like when they're on the vine. Um, but usually they're gonna be about the size of a plum. Uh, the flesh itself is going to be really pungent and it's going to have a um, astringent aftertaste. So it's going to make you pucker. It can be really, really sour. Um, the oriental persimmon can actually get bigger than the native species. It can actually get as big as a peach and um, it's not going to have that acidic bite like our native species do. Um, now there, it, there are rumors with the persimmon that um, if for it to be edible, then you've got to have a frost on the fruit. That's really not true. Uh, frost will actually ruin that immature fruit um, on, the, on the tree. Um, another main point to consider is that as that fruit ripens and continually ripens, then it's going to lose some of that astringency. So knowing where that fine line is between it, you know, it being ripe is going to really um, alter or enhance the flavor de depending on if you like that astringency or not. Um, persimmons will continue to ripen after you pick those. So that's another reason that folks do like those. Um, and many people will pick and just leave them even up to two weeks so they will lose that, that pucker factor. I put a couple of different cultivars in here that we've grown traditionally in the south. And again, um, just be cognizant of native if that's what you're going for. If it doesn't really matter and you just want to get persimmon started, then mixing the two is a fine way to go as well. And here's just another picture to kind of show you what those natives persimmons are going to look like. And you can see they're a little bit smaller. See how they're kind of wrinkled up there uh, versus the oriental type. To me, it almost looks like a yellow tomato instead of, I wouldn't compare it to a peach necessarily, but um, very much a distinct difference in the two. Uh, the other big thing here is that our native, um, they're gonna produce either male or female flowers, whereas the oriental are gonna be a perfect flower. They're gonna form those on the same tree. So our native is gonna be uh, rarely self-pollinating. Um, and you notice from the oriental, it's parthenocarpic, so think about seedless cucumbers. It's going to be the same kind of um, issue there. So no seed. Uh, native persimmons, they won't cross-pollinate with your oriental. So that's another reason that folks can mix those in the backyard and it not be a big deal. 
And you can kind of see the difference there in the flower, not much difference. Uh, the native is going to get about 30 to 40 foot high, whereas the oriental is just going to get 20 to 30 foot high. And some varieties will just be 10 foot. So again, kind of depending on what you're going for in the landscape. Kind of see what the foliage looks there, looks like. Uh, fertility is going to be important with these, just um, using a, a balanced fertilizer, a triple uh, 10 in early spring and then in midsummer. And notice there the rate is two ounces per year of the tree age. Um, and this is something a phenomenal we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks when we do fruit crops, but trees will sometimes crop heavily one year and then that results in a lack crop the next year. Um, that's what we call biennial bearing and it's very common amongst many of our trees, including apple trees. So just kind of keep that in, in mind. Um, if you are fertilizing your lawn and these trees are close, then that's going to probably be adequate enough as fertility, but you want to be careful because again there's a delicate balance there because excess nitrogen fertilization can actually cause your fruit to drop. So you probably heard me in a lot of gardening classes talking about um, adding nitrogen uh, fertilizer to your tomatoes and you've got big bushy heavy foliage but you have no fruit. So that in essence is the same thing with our persimmon. So um, if you're that mentality that a little bit more nitrogen uh, will produce a, a bigger tree with more fruit, that would be wrong. So just be, be careful with that. Um, make sure that you're thinning fruit early in the season to about six inches apart. Um, that's, that's when you're going to be able to know if you're going to have a heavy uh, fruiting year. So thin those out just like you would on an apple tree. And then as the persimmons get older, be aware you're going to have to prune those a little bit more. So you notice here that minimal pruning, we're just um, removing the limbs to prevent that limb crossing and remove any dead or broken or even diseased limbs. Um, but as this tree gets older, you may actually have to open up that, that canopy and spread those limbs out a little bit more. But that's usually at about 10 years of age. All right, so elderberries. Um, of course, we all know where, where this one's at. This is uh, earned notoriety as being the nutritional powerhouse. Um, be aware that it is toxic. The entire plant's toxic, uncooked, if you don't know what you're doing. So just be cautious with that. But this is the American elderberry, Sambucus. Um, oftentimes you'll see it marketed by that name um, as the um, herbal supplements and immune support um, in grocery stores and, and things. Many people will grow this as a large shrub, but you can grow, grow it as a small tree. Uh, again, this is going to be native to the, the United States. There's been stands found growing from Florida to Quebec and, and west to the Rocky Mountains, so it's pretty um, prolific in its range. Uh, the small fruit's got really prominent seeds, and we call this a corium, so that's going to be your term for the night. Um, the other big thing is that it is going to be related to the European elderberry, so if you are purchasing these to grow specific for a native um, edible landscape, make sure that you are um, purchasing the American elderberry. They're going to be very similar in how they grow though. All right, so um, elderberries are um, usually going to be sold to processors to make some of those herbal supplements, um, but there is that growing demand in any of the health tonic industry, and you've probably all seen those, but they're also famous for making wines, juices, jelly, syrups, and, and pies, and um, if you're a um, wine drinker, then both the fruit and flowers are used in winemaking. So just some of the products there um, that you can purchase. And like I say, this is one that's really been growing in the last couple of years. Uh, one of my favorites is elder, um, elder or the elder flowers, the Saint Germain, which is, um, it was France's first artisanal um, liqueur. And it actually has about a thousand of these hand-picked um, elder flower blossoms you see here on the left, but about a thousand of those in each one of these um, bottles. So it, it, it does have a unique um, taste. It does impart a uniqueness to drinks, but mixed with uh, grapefruit juice, it's really fabulous. And you see there that it's got a really delicate uh, floral taste. Um, it's just a very unique liqueur. Uh, as far as elderberries, you're going to have many different cultivars to choose from. 
And most of the cultivars that have been developed here recently in the last 10 or 20 years, those have been developed in New York or Nova Scotia. Um, the University of Missouri has been doing some research on these. So they released two new uh, varieties that yield uh, or produce very well in the South. That's the Bob Gordon and the Wildwood. Make sure when you are thinking about purchasing, because there's so many of you from various areas um, across the South and even in Tennessee, um, climates are going to be a little bit different. So make sure that you research, and I put some of those um, other varieties in the notes so you can refer back to those. But they are going to differ in earliness, yield, and hardiness, um, plant disease uh, susceptibility. So again, it's going to kind of depend on what you're going for. Uh, berry flavor can even be different too. It's going to vary. And then your fruit color is going to range from red and bluish to black to dark purple. And you can kind of see what the bushiness of the plant looks like there. And then here's just a really pretty specimen of what it looks like harvested. So um, one-year-old nursery stock is going to be transplanted um, this time of year in early spring. Make sure that it, the soil is well worked. Um, it, it needs to have room for the, the roots to move. Um, plants are going to be very tolerant of wet or poor sites, but they're drought intolerant. And notice there 5.5 uh, to 6.5 is going to be the best um, pH. Now, when I say somewhat tolerant of wet or poor sites, um, they don't perform well if we're getting repeated flooding throughout uh, the growing season. That will significantly uh, reduce productivity. If you have a really sandy soil, this is one that you don't want to plant. Um, this is where you don't want to plant elderberries. They really don't like um, sandy um, soils at all. They've got a really shallow uh, fibrous root system. And if you are going through and cultivating, if you're planting more than one of these, um, make sure you're cognizant of that too, because the roots tend to lie closer to the surface of the soil line rather than penetrating and going deep. So if you go through and cultivate, um, you can fracture the root system and that can be um, an issue for the, for the growth and productivity too. Um, here's a, another printing video just specific to elderberry. So um, if you're interested in that, make sure you click that a little bit later. Um, but pruning, that's going to be during dormancy, just like now. And we're just removing any of those unproductive, um, dead and damaged canes. Um, that is also going to be beneficial just for managing insect and disease, just taking out a couple of these so we make sure that we get light uh, penetration through there. It helps draw off some of those uh, foliage diseases. You can remove the canes all the way down to ground level, um, just leaving, you know, one to two and three-year-old cane. So it kind of, again, depends on what kind of issue. A lot of people uh, will do that um, after so many years of bearing, they'll pretty well cut them back and let them uh, regrow and retrain them at that point. Um, you can do the complete cane renewal over that selective um, pruning, but you're going to get larger fruit if you're pruning that way and more clusters. So just remember that. And then um, it makes harvesting a little bit easier um, if you're doing it that way as well, instead of having lots of small clusters with small fruit. Uh, there's a lot of words on here, but I want to make sure I covered all this. So um, when we do go to plant and elderberries, uh, full production occurs after about three or four years. You're going to be hand harvesting these in August and September, and you're just cutting that cluster from the bush once all of those berries have fully ripened. Um, that's not, it's kind of like a Concord grape. We're not always going to get even um, ripening within that cluster or within that bunch. So sometimes it's kind of maddening because you know you're wanting to harvest and it's not um it's not you know agreeing with you but just know that berries are going to ripen at different times so usually you're going to be harvesting even the full length of your of your bushes over about a three to four week period um, there's also a link to a video in there about how to de-stem the elderberry because that's going to be um, really important. Um, also be aware that freezing is going to soften the berry, so you're going to lose some of that texture and that really vibrant uh, flavor when you do that. Uh, but you can actually harvest fruit and then refreeze it for later processing or use it immediately. Either one, just like you would uh, if you're processing grapes for juice or wine or jelly or whatever. And then that brings us to the mulberry. So if you're walking in the woods and you're kind of 
eyeballing some of these and hopefully you're going to see that maybe not tonight but as we move through some of our natives and edibles in the coming months uh, many of these are going to be kind of hard to distinguish from one another but the mulberry is it, it kind of stands alone because it's got this really long berry. Now they won't always be that long, but they are going to be a little bit more distinct than some of our other uh, raspberries and blackberries and things, things like that. Uh, mulberries are going to grow best in a well-drained soil, but they are going to be tolerant of poor soil. So if you have an area in your landscape, they can withstand that a little bit easier than some of our other fruit trees. Um, look at your soil on this. This is one if you're wanting to plant mulberries, just make sure that you're sitting on about a 5.5 to a 6. So it does need to be a little bit more acidic than some of our traditional uh, fruit trees or even our veggie and flower gardens. Uh, when it comes to fertilizing the mulberry, make sure that you're doing that in late winter and in midsummer. So this one's a little bit different from some of our other fruit crops, but again, utilizing that um, typical triple 10 around the diameter of that trunk is going to be sufficient. Uh, the cool thing about the mulberry, uh, mulberry is that we have three different species that are cultivated, the red, the black, and the white. And you'll notice here that the red is what is native to here. Uh, the black is native to Iran and the white is native to um, Asia, Japan and um, China. Um, another thing about mulberries, though, irregardless of the species, is that they're going to grow really, really fast for you. So they're really good fruit producers, not only for you, but also for wildlife. So again, if that's something you're kind of looking to grow your landscape for, um, this is one of those that um, they produce pretty uh, prolifically. So sharing with wildlife is going to be one of those that uh, they're going to browse and really appreciate this in the landscape. It does have a flavor kind of like a blackberry, except it's a little bit more mild. Um, I almost think it's more watery or maybe a better um, analogy would be wild blackberries are very tart, whereas the tame blackberries that we grow kind of, I mean, they're sweet, but they're lacking a little bit in that burst of tartness. Uh, so a, a mulberry is going to be more closely related in flavor, I guess, to that tame blackberry. Uh, the fruit drops when they're ripe, and you can actually harvest a mulberry just by gently shaking um, the tree. So you're not going to have to pull like you do on blackberries and, and raspberries. Uh, the fruit's going to be born on the current season's growth, and they'll usually ripen in about May. Um, usually a few problems as far as hardiness uh, across Tennessee, um, but in this area, in northeast Tennessee, if we do happen to get one of those late spring freezes, it can be detrimental. So kind of keep your eye on that um, if you're in the upper eight counties in east Tennessee. Again, about pruning, there's some um, references in there for you to be able to kind of go by because as we all know pruning is going to be one of those practices we need to be doing to maintain the vigor of all of our fruit crops. Um, I did put a few different cultivars in there that perform well in this area. Uh, be mindful, now this is not the native, this is the species actually from uh, Japan and China, but if you're not growing just for the native species, and this is one you want to include, just be aware that it's got some um, disease issues, a little bit more pressure than the red or the black mulberry. So uh, you can probably tell by looking at this that we call this popcorn disease because it actually looks like um, a popcorn kernel. But what this is is actually um, a fungal pathogen. So it's gonna be one of those that spreads by, by wind. If you see this, make sure that you cut this stem back about five or six inches and just burn that material. Because again, um, anytime we see those fungal pathogens, we wanna get rid of that. We don't wanna go throw it on the brush pile or you know, put it in the compost pile or anything like that because those spores can continually reproduce. But this is something we just see um, on the white mulberry. So just be cautious of that. Uh, the other cool thing about the white mulberry, and this kind of went bust, kind of like my poll feature earlier tonight, but uh, the, the first reason that people got interested in the white was because it was the food for the silkworm. So that's why it was imported here because we were going to, you know, get into the silk industry, but that pretty well just uh, went vamoose before it even got started just because of those high startup costs and, and production costs and all that. 
Okay, so that brings us to quince. Um, this is going to be in the same family as apple and pear. You can probably see the how it kind of even looks like a cross, but it, it is the only member of the genus Cydonia. It's in the rose family. Um, this is one that's going to it's going to form a small tree. It's going to have really cool looking flowers um, and leaves. The, the flowers are actually going to form at the end of, of last year's growth and they're usually self-fertile. Um, they can weigh up to a pound a piece and then it's going to again produce that oblong fruit that you just want to you know bite into just like you would a pear or an apple but it's really hard fruit so it's going to be one of those you can't really just pick off the tree and eat it's going to be one you're going to have to cook down and um, make into like applesauce or jelly or some kind of dessert you can kind of see here that they um, they can survive a lot of I guess neglect if you will um, they can also withstand disease and insect pressure um, they really don't care much about uh, soil. You want to fertilize, that's going to help you um, discourage vigorous growth, fertilize lightly, I'm sorry, to discourage any of that really vigorous growth. Uh, so this is one that you're not going to, it's not going to require a lot of fertility is, is what I'm saying. So if you've ever seen fire blight in your apples or your pears, then you're going to know what that looks like. And that is often a result of too high of a, uh, excessive nitrogen. So again, a little bit more is actually going to cause you more harm than good. Now, many people, when it comes to pruning, um, you want to prune that to a vase shape. And if you have any of these drooping, really heavy branches, then you just want to shorten those out. And as this tree gets older, it's going to be the reverse of um, the persimmon that we were talking about earlier. But this is one that you're not going to have to prune quite as much as it gets older. And kind of see what the color looks like there. Sometimes it's even a brighter pink than it is here. Uh, but there's a couple of different recipes in there for the quince. Okay, so that brings us to, um, I have trouble with this one, y'all, because I really didn't know till a couple of years ago that uh, this tree was spelled this way. I always called it sarvisberry in Western North Carolina, and uh, I don't think I ever had the need to write it down or anything, but it took me a little while to realize that sarvisberry and sarvisberry are the same thing. Um, this is also going to be one that's called Juneberry. It just, it's got many names, Saskatoonberry, um, but it is in the Amelanchier family. And it's, this is one that's also going to be native. And you've got about 25 different uh, small fruit bearing trees that are going to belong to this genus. Um, sometimes it'll also be called uh, sugar pear. But really bright colored fruit, uh, nice blossoms. This is going to be one of the first ones that you see uh, blooming in the springtime. If you travel the I-40 Gorge, um, Pigeon River Gorge from Tennessee into North Carolina, uh, this is the one that you'll see prolifically blooming um, in early spring. This is one that's going to be very widely adapted. It's very cold hardy. It is, again, native um, all over the eastern seaboard. And the Prairie Indians and the Cherokee um, all use this as a major food staple um, years ago. They would actually use this to make pemmican, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but it was a major food source for many of our indigenous tribes. Um, Sarvisberry is really pretty as far as the foliage. You can see the brightness of it there. Uh, many people will actually grow this as an ornamental. A lot of people don't even think about really using the fruit, um, but the fruit is also great uh, for birds and wildlife as well. Uh, this is one that you can grow as an understory or you can put it in a corner, you know, tuck it away in a corner of your landscape because it's going to get 15 uh, to 25 foot tall, but if you're giving it full sun, it can get up, up to about 40 foot tall, just depending on how you want, want it to grow. You can kind of train it. Um, the plant is going to sucker, um, so you got to keep those pruned out. Otherwise, you're going to have a bush rather than an upright tree, so be uh, very cautious of that. And again, you can just kind of see what those berries look like. Rich in polyphenols, um, some of those terms we're going to talk about in a, in a couple of months, uh, some of those phytochemical elements, but this is one that's going to be really, really rich in polyphenols. Uh, you can see there that the fruit's going to look like a poem, so it almost looks like a miniature uh, plum. And 
some can range like from the size of a pea up to about the size of a muscadine grape. Let's see what that foliage looks like. I've listed some cultivars that do very well. And again, this is one that is gonna thrive in a multitude of soils. So if you've, you've got an area that's troublesome, um, plant a sarvis berry. If this thing can grow on the rocks in the Pigeon River Gorge, it can pretty much grow um, anywhere. You can uh, propagate these through cuttings, but they're not very successful. But if you plant by seed, um, you've just got to make sure that you're giving them that chilling um, through the winter time. All right, so gooseberries and currants. Um, these are not quite as popular in the US as they are in uh, Europe, but they do provide a really tart flavor. So um, both of these are gonna have that arching growth habit, kind of like our wild blackberries in appearance. Um, but these are gonna be grown specifically for fresh eating or pie making. Um, they are not heat tolerant, which makes them very, very iffy for Northeast Tennessee. But if you've, you know, got a, a corner in your landscape that is shaded um, pretty much all day in the heat of summer, um, then these are some that you can get by with. We have folks actually growing these in Northeast Tennessee, but you've just got to spend a little bit more time on management um, with these. But that being said, they are very winter hardy. So they're kind of persnickety when it comes to the high summer temperatures, but they will survive our cold winters. And usually very uh, much pest free. The only thing you're really gonna have to worry about would be the spotted wing drosophila, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Um, that's gonna be with any of our soft bodied fruit. And of course the birds. Uh, you can see the difference here between the gooseberry and the currant. Um, I myself, I think I would prefer to grow currants because the gooseberries are very thorny. You can see there from that stem. And plus, um, they've got that little um, thistle-like feeling on the outside of that skin as well. Kind of see what they look like as they ripen up. Um, as far as soil pH, you're going to be okay between the 6.0 and 6.5. Uh, you're going to fertilize twice throughout the season, again with that triple 10, just like you would with your, with your lawn. Um, when you first plant these, make sure that you water them throughout that first season and just be very mindful. They don't like those really hot temperatures unless you've got them in the shade. So this is one of those that uh, we term marginally adaptive for this region just because of the, the management issues. Kind of a spin-off um, from the gooseberries and the currants are the Josta berries because that's actually just a cross and you see there that um, it provides a more generous crop than the stingy currant bush without the pesky gooseberry thorn. So it's just the the happy medium but it's going to be very similar in its growth habits um, because of, just because of its lineage, but obviously this is going to be a hybrid, so it's not going to be a true native again if that's what you're going for. Um, but if you're going for the fruit, then this is going to be one that would be um, much easier to grow than the gooseberry or um, the currants. They um, are going to grow really fast. You can actually grow these in zones three to eight, so they're going to be very tolerant. Um, they can withstand temperatures below zero, down to minus 40, so uh, they're going to perform pretty well here. I put some different cultivars in there for you as well. And then we have the jujubes, not the candy, but the fruit, which is a droop that's rich in fiber. And just to remind you, a droop is going to be a stone fruit that grows on trees. So that means it's going to have a stone in the center. So it's going to be very similar to a peach or a plum, um, cherry or a date. You're going to have that really hard center. So oftentimes you'll hear this referred to as the Chinese date. So this is one that has become very adaptable um, in the southern U.S. It's drought hardy. It produces a really um, graceful, open, ornamental tree. It can get up to 40 foot tall though. So if space is an issue, this one could be kind of precarious for you to, um, to grow. The cool thing about um, jujubes, let's see here, yeah. Um, you want to wait till the skin is completely wrinkled like this. Many folks, I mean, myself included, I would want to harvest like this because I'm like, oh Lord, it's turning brown. It's, it's rotten. Um, you know, throw that out. That's actually, remember that it's called a Chinese date. So you, you want to see that shrivel on the, on the tree. 
Uh, trees are going to be self-fertile, but you can increase uh, fertility by cross-pollinating with different varieties. You can actually increase your yield and get a little bit higher fertility. But that's kind of what that will look like from this point right here, just within about a, a week or two. Uh, the kiwi, I started not to put this one in here, but we have so many people that ask about the kiwi um, because there is the hardy kiwi now. Uh, but this is one I probably, even with the hardy, I wouldn't rec necessarily recommend. It's To me, it's a high maintenance fruit too, but my opinion doesn't really count for much. So if you're into the kiwi, this might be one to try, but just know that you've got um, probably some intense management ahead of you. So um, this is also referred to as the Chinese gooseberry. Um, it has been planted in the south um, in research plots as a, you know, experimental. And you can actually purchase these now through garden catalogs. And I meant to do that today. I was going to look that up and kind of see what it said about it, but I forgot. Um, we refer to these as kind of the grocery store type and the commercial type uh, that kind of distinguish between the two. Um, just because they're kind of one and the same, they're just kind of hard to get started. And you can see here that they are going to require that trellising system, so they are going to vine. Um, the leaves can actually get as big as a, as a, like a dinner plate. And then, of course, that fruit's going to be about the size of a hen egg and covered with fuzz, which this one here is not covered with fuzz, but almost kind of looks like um, a fig as far as the fruit does. Um, most of these new hardy cultivars that have been developed will withstand temperatures down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but again they're going to have to be protected from those late spring freezes or the early fall frost or freeze. I didn't spend a lot of time on the hardy kiwi, did I? Okay, so uh, the loquat, this is kind of a unique one. It's an evergreen shrub. It's also called the Japanese plum. Um, it's a really pretty evergreen, so that's one thing that kind of makes it distinctive versus some of the other fruit trees we've talked about. It is very compact. You can't really tell it from that picture here in its, its stature, but it's also got really pretty white blooms. And then the fruit, of course, forms in the fall and the winter and then ripens in the spring. So again, just kind of being careful, being mindful of the fact that uh, freezes can be damaging, but we've seen these produced, um, I mean, in North Georgia in the mountains where our elevation is going to be very, very similar to theirs there. You do want to kind of plant these in a, in a protected location. So if you can plant up against a barn or a building, um, anywhere that you're getting sun for half the day, even during this time of year, that's going to be beneficial uh, to, be, to it being able to withstand and, and adapt to its environment. This is one you're going to have to fertilize about two or three times a year just to kind of keep it vigorous. So uh, kind of keep that in mind, whereas the others will usually do that late winter, early spring, and then we don't worry about it again. Uh, loquats are going to be one that you're going to have to kind of make repeated applications of the fertilizer. As far as pruning, you would just want to go in there and, and cut out any uh, cross vines, just like any of our other fruit crops. Now here's a cool one. I wish I could ask y'all if anybody has heard of the meddler or if anybody is, has grown this fruit, but it's actually been cultivated since Roman times. Um, it's a small shrub-like tree in the rose family. You can kind of tell that by looking there at the fruit. Um, it is cold hardy. It, it grows as far north as, as New York, so this fruit is actually going to form in the springtime. It's kind of a cool looking fruit. But the unique thing about meddlers is how you harvest those. So this, this is kind of like um, we were talking about the Chinese dates a minute ago. This is uh, called bledding. We actually want it to be seasoned by the frost or be softened by the frost. So you can kind of see here how that starts on one side of the fruit and it's um, brown. So a lot of <laughs> myself included, I would cut into that and be like, well, that's nasty. I'm going to chunk that, but this is actually what you want it to look like in its entirety. And then you can make like applesauce, um, but this is just what we call bleded flesh, and we just have to have a frost on it to make it edible. So as far as consistency and flavor, again, it's going to be very similar um, to applesauce, pretty mild in its flavor. Kind of going along with that are the mayhaws. Um, these are 
very well known in, in the South. It's a Southern favorite as far as jellies. Um, they too are in the rose family or the hawthorn family. You can kind of tell by, there by looking at that. So they're going to have these small um, apple looking like fruit that ripens late in April or early May. And the unique characteristic about these are you're going to see them growing um, natively in really wet, swampy areas. And their root systems can actually tolerate being flooded several times a year. So if you have got one of those flood prone areas or a swampy boggy area on your property, then uh, May halls would perform very, very nice there. They're gonna be considered an under, understory tree. So they're gonna be kind of smaller to medium size. Um, they are gonna have really pretty, actually, let me show you this, white blooms with the little pink centers. So very nice contrast um, in the springtime. Much like an apple, uh, as far as its production or its management practices, making sure we prune, get cover sprays on, um, maintaining the soil pH and, and fertility. And then you can kind of see there from the pruning, it's gonna be very similar to an apple. Uh, pomegranates, now these are not gonna be native. They are um, deciduous um, shrub, deciduous shrubs native to Iran. Uh, but this is one, another one of those super healthy um, foods that we, we've seen really hit the, the health market scene in the last decade. And they're kind of a cool little bush. They're really dense, they're really shrubby, um, but they, they do have big thorns on them too. You can't really see that very well here, but they are kind of thorny. Um, they do have a orange looking flower on them in the springtime. So it's really it's really a nice contrast. If you're a Tennessee volunteer, that would be a perfect addition because it is kind of a standout as far as the flower. And then of course, you know what the, the fruit looks like. Um, if you've ever gotten a pomegranate stain on your clothes, then you know that that's one of the most uh, difficult stains to remove from, from clothing. So uh, be wary of that when you're harvesting, really tough to remove. Um, this one's gonna be winter hardy down to 10 degrees. So in a winter like we've had, again, just making sure that you've got it in a protected area, um, up close to a barn or a shed or something like that, and it can really help um, pull heat from, from a, you know, a source. You don't wanna leave it out in the open ground away from everything. And the other cool thing about the pomegranate is they will withstand some of that flooding too. So if you have, um, again, a wet swampy area, this is one that will perform quite well there. And you can kind of see what those flowers look like there. And then the choke cherries. Um, this is a native food staple too for Native Americans and got a very um, unique flavor, but this is the one I was referring to a minute ago that the Indians would make pemmican and I've actually put a recipe in there. I'm getting ahead of myself, but, um, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but this was first cultivated as a crop in the U.S. It was in the mid 1700s, so it's one that's been kind of around before, but it does have some of those harmful glycosides, um, and again, that's a term we'll talk about in a, in a few months, but we've got to be really careful with that because of the cyanide that is naturally occurring in some, well, not just this one, but in some of our fruit crops, just like the the elderberry. Uh, but this is one that um, is really prolific in roadsides, um, medians. Um, it's an excellent bird feeder. And again, it's just got a really cool flavor. But the pemmican is just um, dried meat and dried berries. And so kind of like a mincemeat, but it was known as the first survivalist food, if you will. So it was just, again, an important part of the indigenous cuisine. And it's still used today. So if nothing else, you might want to try even with normal blackberries or any any kind of berry that you're growing, you can use that to make the, the pemmican. So if you're a hiker, um, you know, survivalist, do the backpacking for days. This is a really good um, high protein snack. So um, as far as the natives, again, they utilized every part of this plant. It just wasn't the fruit itself. So they even eat um, the pulp. And, and the stone, they would actually pulverize that and use that, bake that in the sun, and then they would use that uh, for like a flower substitute later in the year. Uh, not to be confused with choke cherries, we also have choke berry. 
And you can kind of tell by looking at the fruit, very similar. But the chokeberry uh, or aronia, you may actually hear it called aronia because like in whole food stores, it's marketed as aronia berries. Um, but it is native to um, the Eastern US. It's a very sour berry. It's not astringent, but it is very, very sour. Um, this is one that you can just pick and eat right off the bush, but more often than not, it's also gonna be one that's gonna be processed much like the elderberries. Um, this is one that you can utilize in a lot of different um, tonics, syrups, um, even wines, um, salsas. It's going to give it, it's going to impart a really unique sour characteristic, um, but it's a little bit different in, an, in its acidity versus some of our other fruit crops. If you know what fot Photinia is, the red tip Photinia, the landscape shrub, blah, 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 I can't talk tonight, um, this is related to the Photinia. It's going to be in that same family. Uh, this is one that's kind of coming on. So um, if, if you're into the, the nutritional, the super berries, make sure you pull that up. Um, I put a link in the Google Drive for you, but um, it's, it's actually becoming known as America's super berry. And then poison berries. This is a um, hybrid. So it's coming from four different plants. It's coming from the blackberry, raspberry, dewberry, and loganberry. So it's going to have characteristics uh, from all of those. But boysenberry, I think this is one of the syrups they actually serve it at IHOP maybe. Um, but you can purchase this in grocery stores. But this is, is it, uh, it is a bramble, so it's going to have that woody stem and it is going to have thorns. Uh, but it's going to have a little bit of a milder taste versus the blackberry. Um, it's going to be sweet like a, a raspberry. A raspberry. It is going to require trellising, so if that's not your thing, um, boys and berries can be kind of finicky with that. Pine berries, we're starting to see these really take off and flourish. Um, these are strawberries with a pineapple smell and a pineapple flavor, and they're white, so you might hear those referred to as ghost berries on occasion too. So these are brand new. They were first introduced um, in 2012. So they are an ever-bearing strawberry. Um, so that means they're going to keep producing throughout the year. And they do have those red seeds, which kind of make them cool. And they taste like pineapple. So they're not self-fertile. So you're going to have to have another variety to cross-pollinate those with. But uh, make sure you've got one plant for every four pineberry plants to make sure that you're getting adequate pollination. The bad thing about your uh, pine berries and even some strawberry varieties, but it's real common with ever bears. Um, they get soft really, really quick. So this is one if you know pick it and use it because they're not gonna they're not gonna store long. They don't have a long uh, shelf life. Anything that happens in your strawberries, it's gonna be the same with pine berries. So some of that stuff you're gonna get information on some of that next week. So just treat them the same as you would your strawberries. Um, this is the Loganberry, and you'll notice there it's got great, great disease resistance, so that makes it uh, pretty cool to grow as far as brambles go. Um, a lot of people don't really think about Loganberries, and they're kind of hard to get here, but if you can order those, they are going to be in the same family as Blackberry, uh, Raspberry. They're in the Rubus family, so they actually resemble the Blackberry a little bit more than the raspberry, but you're going to typically, this is going to be the harvest color when it's ripe, so it's going to be more red like the raspberry. Um, as far as berries, this is going to be the hardiest bramble or caneberry there is because it's going to be able to withstand um, more disease and um, climatic shifts than any of the other berries, like your uh, blackberries, the dewberries, raspberries, um, any of those type crop, crops, your loganberry is going to perform best. So if, you, if you're into growing blackberries and stuff, give this one a try. It's a really good performer. And then we have the dewberry. And remember, this is also apparent to the boysenberry, but this is a, I just think it's a pretty color. I just, if, even if I didn't eat it, I would grow it just for um, landscape purposes because it's just cool. But um, again, they're going to be very um, or closely related to the blackberry. They're going to be um, trailing, though, versus upright. So think about that in regards to space. Um, they're not going to have that floppy, droopy appearance like, like the blackberry. They are going to kind of trail out and be very, very vigorous. Um, the leaves are often going to be used just like any of our cane berries in an herbal 
tea. Um, berries are going to be really tasty. They're really, really sweet. You wouldn't think it to look at it, but they're not going to make you pucker up like a lot of our berry specimens would. And sometimes you will hear this in the South called a ground berry. So you may hear both of those. Um, just a real quick slide on uh, I'm your huckleberry or bilberry. So there is a difference. We get asked that frequently. Um, huckleberries are a wild berry that is wildly or rarely cultivated. Um, this is the one we're going to see growing um, on those heath balds throughout the southern Appalachian or all the way up into um, Canada. And you can kind of see the difference there. Going to be much smaller, more uh, black and shinier than our blueberry species. So um, like I say, many places are going to call those bilberries. So now you can kind of know the difference between um, all three of those. Uh, one of the biggest di distinguishing factors, if, if you don't know by just glancing at it, is to cut it open or mush it with your finger is the seeds because um, huckleberries are going to have less sugar and fewer carbs, but they're also going to have fewer seeds. So they're going to be richer in antioxidants too. And then lingonberries and cranberries, um, these are two that are not going to be well suited for the south. You can get by with growing lingonberries, but again, that's going to require a lot of management on your part, but they have a really unique flavor. Um, this is one of those that's going to be native in some of the old Norse countries, Scandinavia, um, often mixed with um, butter. It's got a really tart um, taste, but it's not one that's going to make you necessarily um, pucker. Uh, some people will say it leaves a bitter aftertaste. Um, but it, it, does, it just has a unique flavor. So making compotes, uh, especially as an accompaniment, just like the cranberry um, to any of the meat dishes is really good. And again, if you're a, a UT volunteer, then cloudberries, um, this is a really pretty specimen to add to your, to your landscape. It is native to Newfoundland, um, our Appalachian forest, the Alpine forest. Um, but they're winter berries, so they actually look like little orange raspberries, and they have a really sharp and, and tart taste. Um, they are like a cross between a like a currant and a and a raspberry. Uh, but we we have known folks that have uh, grown these pretty well. Now, folks like up a, along the probably five thousand foot or more could get away with growing this much better than we could in the in the valleys here in Jonesboro or in Greenville. So the higher the elevation, the better these are going to perform. Um, the other cool thing about the cloudberry is that they're uh, the berry with the highest amount of protein. And you can kind of tell by looking at these that they don't really vine, uh, they don't droop, they're kind of short in stature, almost like a strawberry. They get a little bit taller, but they're more upright. They just don't spread. And then that brings us to muscadines or scuppernogs. Um, these are the oldest known cultivated, uh, or the oldest known cultivated grapevine is in Manteo, North Carolina. They're on Roanoke Island. And it's actually referred to uh, many times as the mother vine. Uh, this is our native grape. Um, many people really like the musky or the foxy scent um, of the grape. It, it yields a superb um, wine a really sweet uh, tasting wine, again with that foxy or muskiness um, odor. It is going to perform quite well in a wide variety of soils, uh, except those that don't drain well. So if you have one of those areas, don't plant your muscadines there. Sandy soils will actually support uh, muscadines. They are going to produce their high shields in the full sun. So like with any grapes, uh, make sure you do that. But if you notice in the in the wild, again, they're going to be growing in the understory under those um, large canopy trees. So um, they can perform well there. It's just that as we move into winter, that could um, become an issue if it's like evergreen shade. A uh, few pest problems. These are one that you actually can grow organically. There are so many um, cultivars, varieties available, it's just unreal. So I put um, a couple of links. Arkansas, I think, has one. Georgia has one. So just make sure you research to know what kind of um, grape, you know, is going to suit your landscape. You are going to have to have a pollinator. Uh, so make sure you know what those pollinating requirements are before you, you plant. 
Okay, so that's going to finish us up with cool fruits to grow.